Hello and welcome to our webinar. Um, thank you so much for uh, joining us today. Um, today we are going to be going over how to switch from Vendor Central to Seller Central. Uh, we have Jeff Moyle and John White here today. Um, I'm here, I'm, my name is Matthew, I'm the Inbound Marketing Manager here at Caspi and I'm just here to take care of a few housekeeping items. Um, first, this webinar is being recorded, so if you have to jump off at some point, we will be sharing a recording with uh, your email. Um, we also are going to have a live Q&A at the end of this uh, webinar, so if you have questions at any time, um, please just drop those questions in chat. When we get to that Q&A, um, we'll save about 15 minutes towards the end, um, at least, to go through those questions. Um, with that, I'm going to go ahead and pass it over to Jeff and John to introduce themselves, and I will be back uh, to moderate the Q&A. Enjoy. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Jeff Moyle. I'm a Partner Success Manager here at Caspian. Uh, I've been in retail e-commerce for 14 plus years um, with a heavy background. I started my Amazon experience on the vendor central side of things. Um, in uh, grocery distribution um, before coming to Caspian. Um, so I have that bit of knowledge coming in and then Seller Central um, actually uh, learning over the last couple years as well, but um, the heavy experience in Vendor Central, which is gonna give a nice perspective today. Absolutely. Hi everyone, my name is John White. Um, I'm also a Partner Success Manager here at Caspian. Um, I have, you know, four plus years roughly um, on the Amazon account management side. Um, I actually started in the seller central. Um, so like Jeff said, it, it'll be interesting to compare and contrast and understand the nuances of each platform. Um, so excited to share that with you. So uh, what does Caspian know of Amazon? Um, so Caspian is very familiar with both seller central and vendor central. Um, Caspian was founded in 2008, uh, originally as a third-party seller. Um, in the years since then, we've made over a billion dollars in sales through our Seller Central um, and really understood what works and what doesn't work. Um, several years ago, we broke into the Vendor Central side um, when Caspian created an Amazon um, agency division. And instead of buying brands, products, and reselling them, we can manage their seller central um, and vendor central accounts for them, uh, applying all of our knowledge, strategy, and tools to accelerate their growth. Thanks, John. So here is today's agenda. Uh, we're gonna discuss why to switch from vendor to seller central, some of the biggest differences, how to switch from vendor and seller, and then we'll leave some room at the end for some live Q&A. And the first topic we're gonna to go to is the why to switch from vendor to seller central. And when it comes to this, I, I like to point out to people from the get go, one of the biggest differences right off the bat is who your customer is. So with vendor central, Amazon is your customer. They are buying your product at wholesale cost from you and then turn around selling it retail to the end consumer that's shopping on Amazon. With seller central, you are the retailer. You're cutting out the middleman going direct to that end consumer. So with Vendor Central, they really prioritize the larger brands, the larger companies, um, and provide their service as such. So if you are a much larger organization, uh, typically you would see a vendor manager uh, assigned to your account. It's a live human being you can reach out to with questions, comments, concerns. Uh, any issues that come along the way and suggestions to help your account grow. If you are a smaller uh, customer of theirs, then everything tends to be much more automated. So if you have a question, even the simplest thing, uh, you're creating a ticket to their support team and they're getting back to you within 24 to 48 hours usually. Um, and that is the experience uh, on that side. Um, John, if you wanna to touch on the, the seller side and how that works. Yeah, so um, as it, it says in the slide there, um, the, the biggest feature on the Seller Central side is just having more control. Um, and that starts with brand representation um, and especially on the pricing um, margin side. Um, you know, having control of your pricing is obviously a huge benefit um, as well as, you know, recognizing that you can control your marketing strategy um and you know being 
being the front face of the customer experience and really having a team set up and in line to handle that um, the exact way that you would want to as a brand. Um, some of the biggest differences uh, that we'll discuss between the two different platforms. The first one is going to be the fees that are involved. Um, when working with anybody, there's always going to be fees of some sort. Uh, Vendor Central tends to be uh, much more uh, flat fee based. Um, marketing co-op is something that is typically negotiated when coming in too, but there's damage allowances, uh, chargebacks, um, shipping fees depending on size and weight of the item, accuracy of that coming in. So there, while there's less fees typically, uh, they could be much more substantial um, because essentially Amazon is buying your product um, and they want to make sure they're getting the best bang for the buck. Um, seller does operate a little bit differently. Joan, if you want to touch on that. Yeah, so on the Seller Central side, <clears throat> sellers will pay a commission on all sales made on the Amazon Marketplace, which is known as a referral fee. Um, this fee varies by product category and selling price, but typically um, it'll be about 15% of each product's, each product's selling price. Um, Amazon will also enact um, storage fees for keeping inventory at their fulfillment centers. Um, as well as fees for order fulfillment. Um, and, you know, I would love to say that we do have a blog post about the fee structure if you'd like to learn more. Uh, next thing is everybody wants to get paid. So how does the invoicing work on either side? Uh, with Vendor Central, uh, when they create a PO and send it to you for order fulfillment, uh, there's a couple different ways they can process this. Typically, it's a manual email that they send out. Um, if your company has the ability uh, to set up EDI uh, as well, uh, they do accept that. Um, but with the invoicing, um, a lot of these POs can come in a couple weeks in advance, up to six months or more, depending if they're planning for holidays. Uh, I've seen a lot of times where they'll create and send you a PO in June or July but then want to receive it in sometime in December. Um, so while that's a big heads up on when you get your product, um, sometime it can be hard to plan and know what and how the, you're controlling that inventory. Um, also with Vendor Central on the invoicing, you'll see the chargebacks come off on when it comes time to pay you then for those items, whether it's a shipping delay, maybe the product wasn't prepped correctly to their standards, you'll see what they pay you and then a list of chargebacks and then your end um, net payment at the bottom of that invoice. Um, and again, Seller Central does operate a little bit differently as well. Yeah. Um, so in Seller Central, seller's income comes directly from consumer sales. Um, like Jeff said, it'll come from a rather larger PO uh, minus the chargebacks. Um, sellers will receive, and Seller Central will receive a direct deposit from Amazon within five business days after Amazon initiates that payment. So while vendors receive chargebacks in the event of an error in adequacy, um, sellers will just uh, receive additional fees. So to summarize there, um, the means differ based on the cash flow of each model, right? So in Vendor Central, Amazon already paid vendors, so it charges them back. In Seller Central, Amazon hasn't transferred sellers their payment yet, so it'll apply fees before delivering that payment. And then as it comes to log logistics, um, there are some differences there as well. In Vendor Central, it's strictly FBA, uh, fulfilled by Amazon. So since they are the ones ordering your products, shipping into their warehouse, they will store it. And then when a customer on Amazon purchases your product, they will ship it out for you. Um, with the logistics side of things, they also wanna make sure things are done in a timely manner and correctly. So they have something called an operational performance dashboard. And in this dashboard, um, it gives you metrics on what they expect as somebody that's purchasing from you as far as um, delays in shipping. If, if there is a delay, there's a chargeback for it. Uh, they expect um, their orders to come 
uh, as expected. So if that order from you is late by an hour, a day, a couple of days, even with notice, um, that can come with uh, various penalties. Um, also prep issues. So if a item isn't packaged to their standards, let's say it doesn't have enough bubble wrap or it's uh, too many items in a box or it's too loose and shaken around in there, um, there's metrics for that as well. With these metrics, if you go over their threshold, let's say if 5% of your orders have a prep issue, then you can be labeled as a, a poor partner, which if you have that flag on your account at that point, it can put you at risk of seeing less POs or lower amount of POs coming through. So you really want to stay within their metrics and be very familiar with their policies, their procedures, their guidelines, and stay in that good standing because that will help you uh, sell more. Uh, they'll want them to buy more from you because they are looked at as uh, a reputable trustworthy and a partner to them that they can rely on. So if you go outside of those metrics, it can greatly uh, hurt the velocity that you're getting those POs. Right, so you just wanna make sure that or the, the seller on the vendor central side wants to be incentivized to, exactly. to, to receive more and larger POs. Yeah, yeah, it's to your benefit to really adhere by their standards to get more product in the door essentially right um on the other side um you know to to the fba side um amazon on seller central will offer fbm which is fulfilled by merchant um, this is an alternative fulfillment method where the seller will take full responsibility for storing inventory and shipping and fulfilling those orders um, this can be done through drop shipping directly from your warehouse um, or 3pl uh, it kind of varies um, depending on what your situation is. Um, sellers may choose to use this as on a, an alternative shipping method or to supplement your FBA inventory and have FBM and FBA running simultaneously to ensure that you have healthy um, inventory levels and that you don't run out of stock. Um, I did see an interesting statistic the other day that 91% um, of Amazon sellers use FBA to fulfill some or all of their orders. So I think it's absolutely worthy of consideration. Um, next thing, a uh, big difference, a key difference is how you can optimize your listings in the different platforms. Um, with Vendor Central, uh, when an item is created, um, you have different types, bullet points, product descriptions, whatever it may be. Um, Amazon, since they are buying your product, and once it once they purchase that and puts it in the warehouse, they are owning that product as well as your catalog. So they do reserve the right to make changes. Obviously, it's within reason if it's a registered trademark brand, they're only limited to that. But if they do make any changes, they do have to get your approval. Um, so you could get a uh, notification or a request from them if they wanted to update or change how your product looks on the website in some way, shape, or form. It could be an image, it could be in the description, it could be a keyword. Um, so essentially they are in control of that item. So you do have the ability to update to an extent, um, but essentially they are in control of how that product looks at that point. Uh, where Seller Central, um, you maintain that full control. Yeah, it just goes back to that control um, component that we had spoken to a little bit um, previously. It's uh, you relinquish that control on the vendor central side. So you know, transitioning to seller central, um, you get to oversee and create and optimize your listing listings um, just about as much as you would like. Um, occasionally, listing updates may pass through an Amazon uh, compliance review. So sometimes those updates will take some time to go live. And if there are other sellers that are selling the same product on those listings, um, there may be a bit of um, comp competition on contributions there. Um, but for the most part, you know, the seller central side really gives you that control on your listing optimizations and um, creating them exactly how, creating and molding them exactly how you would like them. And then kind of along the same lines of control seems to have been a, 
a very common theme that we're seeing here with, with the various sides. Um, when you look at the am, uh, advertising aspect of your products and your account, um, Vendor Central, you can advertise in a couple different ways. You can do it yourself as a self-service model. Um, you can pay Amazon to do it for you for an X dollar fee, um, or you can hire an outside agency like Caspian to do that for you. Uh, but basically, one thing that I stress uh, when people look at advertising through the Vendor Central platform, since you have already sold your products to them, and if you want to advertise in some way, shape, or form, whatever money you're plugging into that model, you're helping Amazon sell your products for you. Um, so whatever revenue comes out of the advertising, Amazon is seeing the revenue side. However, you're looking at it with the aspect not to gain the revenue per se, but to create larger POs. Because if they moved X amount of product and they're increasing that sales velocity through marketing, they're in turn going to have to replenish their shelves, which is going to create POs from you to keep that sales velocity going on the fast moving items. Um, so that is a different mindset that I think a lot of people don't uh, realize when they're looking at advertising on the vendor versus a seller central platform. Um, I really stress looking at it as moving boxes instead of getting the dollars. So you're gonna see the dollars on the PO side, not the marketing side. So uh, it's just something to consider when talking with your finance team and seeing if that is a right fit for you. And as a seller, your customer is the end consumer. So any of those marketing dollars that you invest um, into your advertising, um, those are ultimately gonna go towards your sales. So there is no intermediary between you and the return on your investment for, there, for those ads. Um, sellers can run their own advertising campaigns themselves, or like Jeff said, uh, you can hire an Amazon marketing agency, such as Caspian, uh, to manage those campaigns on your behalf. Yeah, and I think one of the things that we really run into, the one of the, how do I want to say, the, the biggest hurdles that I would say really with Vendor Central that I'm finding is, even though they're your products, uh, the control of how your products are priced or your price, your cost to them, uh, can be a little bit of a struggle at times. So when it comes to pricing on Vendor Central, it is up to Amazon's discretion. So you present them with a cost of an item, let's say $12.99. They can accept or reject that. If they reject it, if maybe a competitor of a like item is selling at a lesser dollar amount, then they may just not purchase from you because they don't think it's a benefit to them. So just like if you were to sell to a brick and mortar store and you have three different products of like ability, they might go with the lower cost one because then the end consumer would be more likely to purchase that. So looking at Amazon as the retailer, this model uh, would be beneficial if you have a vendor central account. Also, if you experience any price changes, uh, cost of goods go up as do anything year over year. So if you submit a price increase to Amazon because your cost of goods went up, they do reserve a 60 day window to review that um, price change and then either implement it and accept it or they can also reject it and just take that out of their system and look for somebody else to sell that same or like product. So once you are locked into a certain cost, you are at their discretion on if there's any changes to that. You can make the request, but it's not always guaranteed. Yeah, and this goes back to, you know, one of the major benefits on the Seller Central side uh, is that control on pricing. Um, you have absolute control over that price and you, it's, it's at your discretion. You can adjust it at any time. Um, however, there are some factors that, that, that should be considered, um, you know, if, you are, you know, mostly increasing that retail price, you know, such as uh, risking, you know, loss of sales uh, due to a higher price point, uh, losing that buy box. Um, if other sellers are carrying the same product for less, um, Amazon is going to want to have the lowest price and for the most part, want to have uh, that low, the lowest price in that buy box um, or a suppressed buy box, buy box, which happens when the product is offered for less um, on another marketplace, which is what Amazon 
calls their uh, marketplace fair pricing uh, consideration. So a lot of factors that play there, but at the end of the day, the choice is yours um, and you can, you can make it exactly how you want it. Yeah, thanks for that. And uh, I think just a lot of good points and comparisons. Um, the next slide, we are gonna move along to uh, how do you make that switch from vendor to seller central, uh, if that is a choice you're wanting to make. And uh, John's gonna take us through that first step on how to do that. Yeah, so it may seem um, somewhat obvious, but I think it's absolutely worth mentioning that before you sell on seller central, you need to set up a seller account. Um, so one thing to note is that Amazon does not permit all brands to operate as sellers. Um, Amazon has been known to require larger brands to sell in Vendor Central um, if they want their products to be sold on the Amazon marketplace at all. Um, if, if you are currently in Vendor Central and you have a vendor manager currently assigned to you, it's critical that you confirm with them that you're not prohibited from transitioning from vendor to seller central. Um, you know, you know, we'll, we'll need to understand in order to create a seller central account, um, they, they need to verify the legitimacy of your business. Um, so we've listed out some things that um, are some requirements for setting up that seller central account. Yeah. And then once you get all the, the bricks laid out, all of those details situated. The next step, which is a very, very, very important, is you want to mark your items in your vendor central catalog as permanently unavailable. And I say that is because, again, Amazon is owning that catalog. You don't have the ability, even though they're your products, to delete any items out of their catalog anymore. So once it's in there, it is locked in. So even if you have a discontinued item or uh, if you have a replacement item, you don't have the ability to delete the old ones out of the system. So all you can do as a brand with a vendor central account is mark it called permanently unavailable. And what that does is it flags the Amazon system to not create a PO for that item moving forward. So if you're creating your seller central account and you're filling your inventory, you're getting ready to launch and and click that button for people to purchase from you, Amazon, even though they can't order from you at that point, mark, once you mark that permanently unavailable item, they still have residual inventory in their warehouse to sell through. So it would benefit to see what that inventory is, how many units, and keep track of that as it starts to dwindle and then hit zero, then you're if you launch your items, you're not cannibalizing yourself and playing against Amazon at that point um, to try to beat them out because it won't happen. So if Amazon has a product and another seller has the same thing, Amazon will beat them out in the buy box every single time. So you want to make sure your inventory is gone before or close to it before you launch your own products to make available to the public. Yeah, I think that is, is worth noting um, when it comes down to that. There isn't really any competition. Amazon is gonna is gonna win that every single time. Um, so that's uh, that's definitely important to note. Um, yeah. So when it comes to Seller Central and as you start building out your catalog, um, one of the most important things is going to be optimizing your listings. Um, and so once you've really secured and feel comfortable with where your catalog is set up. Um, that next step is to, to you know, um, start building out, you know, keyword research, um, as well as, you know, optimizing those titles, those bullet points, those product, product descriptions, um, and indexing those keywords in the back end as well. Um, making sure that, you know, customers understand exactly what they're buying, um, who the brand is, and, um, you know, increasing that brand loyalty. So. Um, as a new seller, you lack seller authority. This is super important. So, uh, which is a ranking factor that Amazon search algorithm um, creates. And so some of these things are, consist of seller age, um, total seller reviews, average seller rating, um, number of returns, number of sales, and you know, historic inventory coverage, um, the list goes on and on. So 
uh, you really need to start building a reputation with Amazon um, in order for them to recognize you as a true reliable seller. Um, so effectively being a new seller means you're giving up some momentum in exchange for more control. Um, I think that's really important. So as you build seller authority, you'll regain that momentum. Um, but it does take time. And I think that's important to recognize from the beginning um, that it's not gonna, it's not gonna be easy if you don't have anything really set up. Um, if you are transitioning from vendor central to seller central, you may have reviews um, and you may have some of those rankings, but um, it, it'll take time for that to transition over. Um, so it's important that you optimize every other ranking factor to kind of compensate and make up for that difference. Um, go yeah, ahead. I think that's good too, because one thing I was going to mention is a lot of uh, people I've talked to about this various issue, the same issue, is they assume that just because their products were on Vendor Central and now it's moved over to Seller, which the transition is fairly simple, they assume that everything is just going to take off like it was. Well, not everything transitions over very clear. Uh, like anything in life, a lot of times there's a transition, you're, there's going to be hiccups. So yeah. there's been times where I've seen a product move over, we copy the ASIN, bring it over in the seller catalog, and all of a sudden the bullet points are gone that describe an item, or the product description is slightly different. Um, the keywords may have dropped out in some way, shape, or form, or something as, as simple as the package, case, item, weight, height, everything that describes how that product is going to ship um, may fall out of the system, which can cause issues. So yeah. when it comes to optimizing those listings, like John was saying, um, it's really good to go through it with a fine tooth comb. If you do it yourself, have the know-how or have an agency that specializes in this and know what to look for, um, it behooves you to really deep dive on those items before you launch it out. Um, because the last thing you want is to make an item active and for somebody to buy and then wonder why it's not selling because it's surely just missing information that you already have because it's your products. Uh, so you really want to take that under your under your wing and, and make sure that it is described how you want it to look. Yeah. Yeah. At the end of the day, the details matter. And I would envision the seller central if you are making that transition that these are skeleton listings. These don't have um any history whatsoever um so i would i would advise for you to look at it that way that this you're starting from scratch even though if you are making that transition you're ultimately starting from scratch and you want to treat it that way um and i will say on the keyword research front that you know one way to really um make those optimizations is keyword research um and you do utilizing some tools like mark uh, merchant words jungle scout helium 10 um, and you can also read customer reviews on your and competitors listings to see what types of terminology shoppers are using to describe your product and the features. So while you're at it, see what keywords competitors seem to be targeting um, in their listings and, and use it against them. Um, once you've identified ideal keywords, just make sure that they're thoroughly incorporated throughout your listing um, which you know will include your title, your bullet points, your product description. Um, and one thing to also note is that it, they should be indexed in the back end. So even though they're not reflecting on that detail page, um, Amazon takes in all of the keywords that uh, are included in your listing, um, despite them not necessarily being included on the PDP. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, and then really moving on, that's a great segue to the next slide in enhancing your products and listings is building out the A plus content. Um, you may already have it, uh, maybe not, um, but that is a really great way to enhance how your product looks. Um, John, if you want to touch on, on this slide here. Yeah, yeah, thanks. So um, according to DataHawk, uh, a plus content is one of the most is the top three influential factors uh, for customer conversion. So it is crucial for sellers to have A plus content on their listings. Um, I think in the past that this this has been something that uh, was just kind of an add on, but at this point in time, it's it it should be a requirement for 
for anyone that's really trying to drive business on Amazon. Um, so this aligns with Caspian's insights, which show that A plus content um, increase, increases conversion rate by you know around 12%. Um, so this this suggests alone that you know making sure that your A plus content is up to par uh, is a differentiating factor for shoppers. Um, it gives you that that brand credibility. Um, again, it under it allows customers to understand who you are as a brand, what you represent. And um, and you know gives you that extra extra push. Um, similarly, brand stores uh, will help you set apart. So brand stores is essentially a website um, that is exclusive to your brand and your products on the Amazon marketplace. Um, so think about it in terms of like a brick and mortar. Uh, the you know what's the difference between walking into a branded store like Nike and walking into the mall? Um, you'll see hundreds of brands in a mall, but in Nike store, you'll, you'll see exclusive Nike products and you can compare and contrast um, the products that are exclusive to your brand. So that's another really great opportunity for you to, to really maximize the, um, the reputability of your brand and exactly what, um, how you want it to be perceived um, for customers and um, just gives them another buying option, essentially. Um, and when you have an Amazon brand store, you gain that access to millions of shoppers that are thrown, you know, flowing through the Amazon marketplace. Uh, and at the same time, you'll keep competitor products out of sight. Yeah, I think that's a good point. Uh, it does really set you apart from your competition. Uh, I think another thing that it enhances uh, for your products too is it's a store of all of your items, so it potentially could create that repeat shopper. It might expose them to items that maybe they didn't even know you had or made um, because they look at that one item every single time. When it comes to find out going to your brand store, you could have a multitude of products that are new to them. So it creates more exposure and it expands the ability to, to sell more of your goods. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, so that leads us into Amazon ads. Um, so once you've established a firm foundation with your optimized listings, you've built out the A plus content, you feel really good about the brand store, you'll want to generate and convert extra traffic through Amazon advertising. Um, I do, I think it is important to note that um, if you don't have all of those things, um, you know, such as a listing optimization, A plus content, brand store, uh, fully optimized, and you feel really comfortable with it, um, I would not suggest, you know, launching, getting too crazy into Amazon advertising uh, because, you know, the, the conversion rates just won't be as high as you would like them to be. So at Caspian, we see an average sales lift of 30% when we implement ad Amazon advertising for our partners. Um, and it can truly be a game changer and is super important um, as, you know, the number of sellers on the Amazon marketplace, marketplace increases. Um, and in turn, those ad budgets increase as well. So it's becoming very competitive. Um, so it's, it's important that you have that, you know, fully built out and you have a, a firm uh, plan in place when it comes to Amazon ads. Um, the types of ads that a seller can run um, vary from sponsored products, uh, sponsored brand, sponsored video, and sponsored display. So you have a multitude of options in how you want to um, you know, expose your product on Amazon and uh, ideally generate new shoppers and, and build those conversion rates. Yeah, and you know, as far as this how to make this switch, you know, we've talked of moving over the ASIN, shutting off the vendor central ones, optimizing your listings, getting it in front of that customer. Now that they're buying your product, you need to make sure that product stays on the shelf to make it available to them. The last thing you want to do is run out of stock on an item. So this is where it really varies from the vendor central platform. They're creating a PO, they're sending it to you, you're fulfilling it, shipping it, your hands off at that point as far as the product goes. With seller central, you are the shipping. You're the ones that are taking these orders from the consumers and needing to fulfill and making sure that they get their product in a timely manner. So even though Amazon is the one 
actually taking and fulfilling that, you need to make sure that your products stay on Amazon shelves. So where before you didn't really have to worry about that piece of it. So at this point, you are taking that front step forward to making sure that you have forecasting. You look at all the data that's given to you in the Seller Central platform through the numerous reports that they put out there so you can see sales trends. You know that an upcoming holiday in three months, you're going to need maybe 100 extra items sent in there because that's what your sales showed last year or that's what it showed in the last six months if it was a seasonal item. So looking at velocity, year over year trends, month over month trends. Um, also in the seller platform, you're able to see what all your current inventory levels are and you can dictate how you make that available, when you make that available. You're the ones analyzing this data, creating your own POs, so you have that full control with your own inventory. Uh, it's something where I find people really enjoy that aspect because it does put them in control and less likely to run out of stocks if you're running a tight ship. Um, it also does take a lot of time. So if you don't already have someone that is well-versed in inventory management, um, it would be good to look at somebody or get an agency that's well-versed in it because it is a very time-consuming process, but in the end, it also gives you the flexibility and ability to maintain your product you know, levels um, in the Amazon warehouse. Yep. Yep. And, and with, yeah, sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, with uh, maintaining the inventory levels, uh, there's a lot of capabilities that you have to get your products to customers. And, and John will touch on that here. Yeah, thanks. So, um, to dive a little bit deeper into the FBM side of things, um, if you were selling um, since like March 2020, uh, most people are aware that it's been extremely volatile. Um, the pandemic has overloaded Amazon's capabilities and FBA has been in constant growing pains ever since uh, since that time and, and they're just really trying to catch up. So as a vendor, you were kind of stuck with FBA unless you sold to a third party retailer um, as well, or you created your own selling account. And if you are transitioning fully out of vendor central to seller central, uh, you would be wise to invest in FBM if you have the capability and you have like the resources to do so. Um, as mentioned, this may include enabling dropship capabilities, uh, partnering with a 3PL, um, or exploring peer-to-peer -peer, peer fulfillment. Um, again, as mentioned in one of the previous slides, um, running FBA and FBM simultaneously is an, ide an ideal scenario uh, because you know if you do run out of FBA, um, you'll still have control over that listing with your FBM inventory. Um, you will lose that prime eligibility because uh, fulfilling your products through Amazon uh, do give you that prime badge and reduce that, that shipping window uh, fairly significantly as well. So some things that go into that, but uh, high level, that's kind of where we are with FBM. Yeah, and then really to, to end this off, uh, the customer service processes that you have in place, um, you really want to stand out to your customer. You want to be able to communicate with the customer. They are your, your greatest advocates. Um, John, if you wanna to touch on a couple bullet points on this one. Yeah, and it, it again goes back to that control theme that we've kind of been uh, trying to emphasize throughout this, this presentation here. Um, you, you, that control comes back to the customer service um, and handling that entire process. Um, so it's really important that you have that streamlined and you understand exactly how you want to interact with your customers. Um, in Vendor Central, Amazon Retail is the seller, so they'll handle that customer service. Um, but in Seller Central, you may be li liable to provide customer service um, and Amazon will handle the fulfillment related issues like the, your returns, but other customer concerns will ultimately fall on you. Um, and if you're not up to speed on what needs to be provided, um, this it, it won't play to your benefit. Um, so this can be a really great opportunity to strengthen your brand's relationship with your customers. Um, 
but it also takes effort. Um, and it's crucial to do your due diligence and establish a strong process for Amazon customer service. So um, I would recommend taking the time to write out a standard operating procedure on how your customer service team should and when they need to respond um, to various scenarios. Um, because on Amazon, you know, anything goes and there, there are a lot of different types of um, scenarios that you're gonna have to deal with. So understanding those and how you wanna go about um, interacting with your customers uh, is, is pretty crucial. So by codifying that process in advance, you equip your customer service team um, to work independently and allows your business to, to scale. Yeah, I think that's great. And you know, if if you have if you don't have the time and resources, Amazon does have something called CSBA, Customer Service by Amazon. Like anything else, it's an added fee uh, if you want them to do something for you. Uh, it's a service they provide. But what I've seen is when the manufacturer, or the brand themselves, handle the customer service side of things, it creates a much stronger relationship with that end consumer. Um, and typically the communication is much more clear, it's effective, uh, it just allows you to, to relate to that customer as well and vice versa, uh, just having that open line of communication. So I highly recommend uh, doing yourself if you can. Um, and really at this point, you are in sustain and grow mode. Uh, you've set everything up, you've done all the right things, you've optimized your listings, you've set up the shipping cadences, you are ready just to have your account grow. And you know by providing that stellar customer service, maintaining your inventory, it's not always gonna be sunshine and rainbows. It's just not, it, any business is that way, but really by putting in that solid effort to get the, the foundation of your business yeah. online going, and you can just maintain it at this point, your the opportunities is very real. Um, and I, see it every single day and how businesses when they put in the right amount of work and effort it does come back and reward you in the end so mm -hmm. i don't know if you want to end off with anything john but i just can't stress that part enough no yeah i think that was well said um it will pay dividends so um i think you know from the jump there's going to be a lot of um different holes that you're going to have to go through um and work that you're going to need to to put in um, to establish that that firm presence on Amazon, um, but it will be it will play to your benefit. Um, so putting the time and effort in from the very beginning um, is 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 strongly encouraged. Um, and then yeah, like you said, that ongoing management is uh, is just you know something that you're going to have to deal with on a day to day basis. Um, but also understanding that. You know there are going to be hiccups like you said there are going to be hiccups there are going to be hurdles that you're going to have to deal with um the just with the amazon platform the way it's set up uh that's just the nature of the beast so um so yeah i think that that is all uh all really good points there yeah thank you for that well at this point we are at the end of our presentation and opening up some to some live q a so matthew if you want to take over at this point yeah. Um, first, thank you, Jeff and John. This was absolutely fantastic, a, a true wealth of knowledge. Um, so thank you for sharing that with all of us. Um, we have received some questions throughout the webinar. Um, as a reminder, if you do have any questions, uh, we have about 15 minutes here left, and we're just going to start working our way through the list. Um, so the very first one I want to uh, pose to you, and I'll pass this to you, Jeff, is why not both? Why not sell in Vendor Central and Seller Central um, simultaneously? No, that's a good question, and thank you for that. Um, I think it goes back to what I said before, where, um, for one, if you have products in both, you are going to be cannibalizing sales uh, because they're both going to be readily available to the consumer. Uh, but if Amazon is owning your product on the vendor side, they are going to, nine times out of ten, beat out your seller central ad every single time uh, because they want to move product that's in their best benefit so essentially you're competing against yourself but with amazon's additional resources to be able to manipulate how that product is appeared and sold to the customer uh, it just wouldn't play to your benefit in that 
way. I under, I understand the thought behind it, where the more avenues to get it out to people, the better. But it might be more beneficial to have a seller central account and then maybe some other type of selling platform. I don't know if it's Walmart.com or Target, whatever, some different way of getting it out to the consumer instead of two channels through Amazon, which essentially is the same thing. You're going to lose out to them nine times out of ten. And I, I do want to note that um, if you are a, a somewhat of a strong player on the vendor central side, um, there will be times that Amazon will prevent you altogether from setting up a seller central account uh, because they want to own that business. So um, I think that's another thing that that should be considered. Mm. Yeah, that's a really great point. Um, similarly, this goes back to the, the advertising side that you two were talking about, um, specifically vendor central advertising. If you as the vendor um, don't put any um, any budget into advertising or a minimal budget into advertising, will Amazon retail as the first party as a seller, um, will they ship in budget or is it all provided by the vendor? It's all provided by the vendor. Uh, for additional marketing, you know, it's it's in their best effort of presenting their products, right? So they could potentially put out a couple of ads here and there. Uh, it's going to have the lowest price uh, of any like item out there. So that's the benefit to when people do the search, they optimize the keywords. So they're looking at getting in front of the consumer in various ways. But when it comes to advertising, they if you want that done, you're going to have to put in the budget. Uh, like I said, they will present themselves as being able to manage that for you for an added cost. Uh, if you don't have the resources or time to do it again yourself, but essentially, if you want to push that product, it relies on on you to supply that. Great, thank you, Jeff. Um, this next one, I'll pass to you, John. Uh, it's about um, the fulfillment and drop shipping. Uh, so, if you uh, fulfill orders through dropship as a seller. Um, then you would pay only the referral fees, correct? You wouldn't have to pay the storage or fulfillment fees to Amazon. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Good question, Matthew. Um, yeah, pretty much as simple as that. Um, the fees are going to be the fees are going to be reduced on the FBM side. Um, but again, as mentioned earlier, you know there there are uh, fairly significant benefits to sending your inventory into into FBA um, or the fulfillment centers in Amazon, um, but when it comes down to you know on the on the fee structure basis, yeah, it's uh, it's going to be less than being FBA. Mm -hmm. And that makes sense. And the the con, the downside to that is that you, like you mentioned earlier, John, you won't necessarily have that prime two day shipping built in with Dropship. Yep. Yeah. Correct. And I that that's a that's a huge huge selling point. For customers, um, I'd love to know this statistic, but I, I know that it's it's very high for um, you know conversion rates versus you know from um, you know the shipping window matters. Customers now expect their products to arrive in a in a two day window um, or yesterday, is, <laughs> yeah, or yesterday. <laughs> um, the expectations are are so high, so it's kind of become the standard to be. Uh, to fulfill your products uh, via Amazon, um, but having that option is is pretty great. You know, if you don't have the capabilities there, mm, that makes sense. Um, we do have a follow up uh, to a question you asked earlier, Jeff, um, regarding selling in both. Uh, what if you split the um, inventory you make available to Vendor Central versus inventory you sell through your own seller account? Um, have you seen this be an effective strategy? That yes. Um... And really is what I recommend. If you really do want both, the best way to do that is to split up your inventory so they aren't competing against one another. Um, I see this more so when, if you have a vendor central account and you're tinkering with the idea of having a seller, but you don't wanna fully commit. Maybe you wanna test out the waters for a bit. You wanna see how it works, get the account up and running and some relevancy. I've seen a lot of brands, they will take a handful of products items whatever you want to call it and take it out of the vendor inventory put those ones in seller and then give it three six nine months to see how that performs is it in your best benefit 
you have the ability at that point then to compare the different fees. What are the chargebacks? Is, are you making a better margin? And then you can make that determination to fully transition over or some people find it's just not right for them for various reasons, but it does allow you to kind of test the waters, if you will. So that I see is the best way to do it. Um, and really the only way, because if you have, again, the same items in both, you're not going to really see the true sales potential that could come out of that with both. So splitting up yeah. the inventory is highly recommended. Yeah. And I will say um, I work with a brand in the, in the pet category and um, what we've been able to do is we do have a seller central and a vendor central both set up. Um, we use the seller central account to supplement the inventory um, in vendor central. So as Jeff said, um, Amazon's 100% going to win that buy box um, if they have inventory available um, on the vendor central side. Uh, but in the, the rare case that they don't, um, that listing will still be live and the product will still be available because it exists in seller central. Mm. I see. Um, getting more questions, a lot more questions here. Great to see this engagement um, from our audience. Uh, really love it. Uh, this question is about the, if you want to shift from vendor central to seller central, do you actually have to go ask the vendor manager or is there information, the terms and conditions or other agreements um, that might help you determine if Amazon's going to restrict you to vendor central only? Uh, I don't know, John, if you want to take this one. I, I know it's always a good idea if you have a vendor manager uh, to check with them first because they would obviously have most insight on those policies and procedures, mm -hmm. how the account is set up, what does the relationship look like, how long has that relationship been standing. Uh, so I would always recommend to check with them first. Uh, I don't know, John, if you have any other insights to that. Yeah, no, I think it's it's great to check in on that. Um, you know, it, I I I would imagine that you know Amazon is gonna make is gonna generate um, more revenue on the vendor central side. So my guess is that they're gonna advise for you to stay in vendor central. Um, so you know, it, it's uh, I think at the end of the day. Um, a conversation is 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 absolutely worth having with your vendor manager and understanding if you know it, it, if it even is like a possibility for you to make that transition. Yeah, and one one thing I would add to that is anecdotally from what we've observed, uh, these use cases tend to be for some of the largest brands. Um, it's it's not the go to practice, but it does happen. Um, so due diligence is always advisable, um, but it's still worth, uh, if you want to be a seller, it's, it's certainly worth pursuing. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you never want to hurt a good relationship. You know, it's different if you're having bad experiences and not getting anywhere you want to break off. But if you do have a good relationship with Amazon too, the last thing you want to do is, is hurt that and then go mm -hmm. try, to find, try to start something else on Seller Central. And then now you don't have the support maybe. <laughs> Uh, that could be there. So there's a lot of factors to look into it. Um, but like you said, Matthew, do your do due diligence, uh, check with the connections that you have there if you have any, um, and, and create a plan. Uh, just create a plan, and, and that's the best thing I could advise. A few more questions I'm going to try to squeeze in over the next five minutes. Um, one is, what if you are selling to Vendor Central, but for some reason you continue to lose buy box um, to third-party sellers, uh, would you recommend creating your own seller account uh, to to step in? Sounds like this might kind of be similar to um, that process you mentioned earlier, John, about having a seller there as a backup. Yeah, yeah, I think yeah, that would be recommended. Um, that's surprising that uh, you're losing the buy box to to other sellers um, on the vendor central side. So. Um, short answer, yeah, it would be it would be to your benefit to open up that seller central account, um, create more avenues for you as a seller, um, and to win that buy box um, because the, at the end of the day, that um, that truly matters. And um, I think exercising all the options that you have 
to win that buy box, if that does mean sell, setting up a seller central account, absolutely go for it. Yeah, I think I would add to that too, is find out from vendor central is why you're losing that buy box, you know, because yeah. it really isn't their best benefit, benefit to beat out those other retailers. So why ask the questions? Uh, that's the other thing with Amazon that I've found is I want to be just very complacent with what you're seeing or the answers you're getting. Keep pushing. You know, you are, it's your products. So if, if you're losing that buy box, why is that happening? Where can you make improvements? It could be as something as simple as just missing some product information and yeah. it loses its, its tiered structure, whatever you want to call it. So find out the why is first instead of just reacting and to create an account. But again, if, if it makes sense, then creating that secondary seller account may be beneficial. Mm. Great point. One last piece I'd add to that is that uh, sometimes Amazon will list um, products even when they are out of stock. And that would be a factor into why you're losing the buy box to third party sellers. Amazon might actually be out of stock. Yeah, and they may not correct. be making, uh, creating POs for those. So that would be, like Jeff said, that would be worth digging into to understand, you know, if they aren't creating POs, why are they not creating POs and getting a better understanding there? Yeah, exactly. Um, we have uh, six more questions, three minutes. We won't get to all of them, but we'll try to do a few more. Um, one is uh, about timeline. Um, we talked about the, uh, there's going to be a dip in performance um, when you shift from vendor to seller. How long does it typically take um, before the transition kind of before you recover that momentum on the seller side? I think it, it varies um, by the brand, uh, your history um, in the accounts, the, you know, the longevity of your products, the reviews, uh, everything's taken into consideration, but um, from my findings, anywhere from two to four months to really get it, uh, that momentum ramped up. Same thing with marketing. You know, if you're creating a brand new campaign, it's always recommended that it takes three to six months to really see the true performance of that campaign. It has to build relevancy. Um, it has to it has to build that following, right? So um, with just getting new products and organic sales, not even looking at advertising, you know, it could take days, it could take a couple of weeks, but I really encourage people to don't go into this and see it as a golden ticket. Understand it's going to take time to build that relevancy. So if you're not seeing something in two to three weeks, start asking questions, looking at different ways to optimize and get in front of the customers, look at the advertising piece, but uh, it's not going to happen on day one. But just understand it's going to take some time. Uh, yeah. I don't know, John, if you want to add to that at all. Yeah, no, just the optimization piece that we touched on, uh, as well as advertising, you know, generating as much traffic as you can to your listings and increasing that conversion with the optimizations that you made to those listings as well. Yeah, good point. Um, our last question uh, before we close out is for high compliance products, um, which tends to be better, vendor central or seller central? Good question. Uh, That's John, a great question. Do <laughs> you want to take this one? Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's relevant um, to both of us. Uh, yeah. We're dealing with that on on both sides. So, um, man, I would probably say that it's it's a little bit easier just currently, like recency bias. I'd probably say on the seller central side. Uh, but again, it varies depending on the category, depending on the product. Um, depending on the brand, there are a lot of different variables that go into that. There is, and, and I'll end off with that as well, where I've seen it be beneficial on both sides. Uh, again, it comes down to the type of products you have. What are the compliance issues? You know, on the vendor side, Amazon is going to try to push and get things compliant if they can, because again, it's going to serve their benefit, right? They want listings to be active. They want to be able to sell. Uh, so they will push and push and push if it is possible to get that done. Uh, on the seller side, it is completely up to you. So you don't have that big brother looking over your shoulder to say, hey, we need to get this done. This needs to be certain X compliant, but it might be an easier way because you have more control on your products. 
So again, it, we're talking about control again. Uh, so again, it just depends on the item. Uh, you know, I would look into before you going into a seller account or a vendor account, just doing some research on are your products compliant? What is Amazon's compliancy policies and standards and testing? So definitely dig into that. Again, it goes into the prep, the research. Um, just make sure you understand what you're getting into and, and what that looks like. Hmm. All right. Well, um, once more, thank you uh, to our speakers, Jeff and John. Thank you to our audience for those who stuck with us throughout this. Um, really great content today. Uh, we're going to wrap up here. I wish you all a great Thursday. All right. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for having us. Appreciate it.